There we go. Now it's good morning, everyone. Hope everybody's had a great week. We've had an interesting and a very great week here. The thing we're going to talk about during this session primarily is rock orchid. And this is a great cliff tea. I'm not going to talk very much about the trip, although to say that it has been going well. We've visited several tea farms. We've also visited a few coffee farms, and that's been eye-opening in terms of understanding more about the relationship of the soil uh, to the eventual outcome of the product. So it's it's been really, really interesting. And the coffee farmers have a somewhat similar understanding of how that relationship works. The same as the farmers in the Wui Mountains. That's been really interesting because you hear them say some of the same things. And obviously here in Hawaii, they have volcanic soil, just like they do in the uh, Wui Mountains. So this has all been very, very interesting from this point of view. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today is about rock orchid, the rock orchid session. And we have a guest moderator today. That's Megan Walsh. So she'll be uh, helping me see your questions and getting those to me so that I understand what you're asking and hearing your comments. So Megan, thank you very much for uh, volunteering to do this today. And let's go ahead and start right in on Rock Orchid. Rock Orchid is one of our favorite and most unusual of the cliff teas. There is very little of it produced it's been produced for a long time, mostly as a wild varietal growing between rocks on cliff sides. And in some, in these recent years, a bit of it has been domesticated, but it's more wild than it is domesticated. Although, as I said, in the recent years, you do have some domestication of it. And one of the reasons you domesticate any of these varietals is to use them in the production of scarlet robe. Because in the production of scarlet robe, as you may remember, you're going to end up with some sort of blend. And to be able to bring in the flavors, the variety of flavors from the Wui Mountains is all part of the magic in the blending of the particular teas that they use from the Wui Mountains. Rock orchid grows all over the Wui Mountain. And, and by, by all over, what I mean is you can find it in various places within the national or within the World Heritage Site. But again, from a domesticated standpoint, not very much is being produced. So. What are some of the characteristics of rock orchid? Well, first off, in terms of a history, just like with the other varietals within the Wui Mountains, you have some poets and you have some uh, scholars who've known of this tea for a while. They've written some very interesting things about them. And so one of the slides that uh, we sent you, or one of the pictures we sent you has two Chinese characters on it. And those two Chinese characters are Yan Yun. And literally what that means is the poetry of the mountain. And so rock orchid fits very nicely and by the way, some others would translate this a little differently. Instead of poetry of the mountain, they might say poetry of the rock, poetry of the cliffs. So remember, I do all sorts of translations, and then I catch myself realizing that there's multiple ways to think about it. But you get the point. The point of the mountain here that's talked about is very specific to the Wui Mountains. It's specific really to the elements 
of the Wuyi Mountains, which are the volcanic elements. So when they talk about this rock rhythm or a cliff rhythm, they're really talking about that underlying minerality because that's really the main part of the rhythm. Now, this isn't going to be a session on poetry, although I'm going to wander for a brief second here. Many times when they talk about essence or rhythm, sometimes they also use a term which can be translated as milk, but I don't like that translation. I really like the translation of cream. So like cream of the crop, that type of cream. In other words, the essence of what a cliff tea is. And so sometimes that's utilized in terms of talking about this particular varietal. And you'll get this because this flavor is big flavor. Not only is it big flavor, it's changeable. And changeable is, is kind of a funny word in this particular instance. By changeable, what I really mean is when you first drink this, you have one impression, but it strongly gets altered and modified as you drink through this. So that's one of the things to be on the lookout during this session. Let me clean up one other thing that I realized that for those who have the new pots, I should have cleaned up in the email and I forgot to do that. And actually we forgot to alter the usual amounts. So for most of you, the amounts of tea that you got are precise, six grams. And the steeping time is gonna be three minutes. But for those who have the newer clay pots, it's a whole different set of rules. So since we sent you six grams, we're going to alter the time. Ordinarily, we would alter the grammage for you. Or ordinarily, what we should have done is sent you five grams. But we sent you six. That's no problem. So when you brew, you'll brew for two minutes and 20 seconds. So we did some test runs here to make sure that that works. And so that's what you should look for today. The rest of you, if you don't have one of these brand new expensive pots, three minutes, six grams, and you have the grammage already set out. All right, so let's go ahead and do the brewing of this tea right now. And actually, You'll have a demonstration and then you'll brew the tea. So I'm going to ask the tea master to come on over and brew and then go ahead and you'll brew with her. So let me get out of here. I'm going to go where? Yeah. Ah, yes. Okay. That's what I thought I was supposed to do. Yeah. This here. John, for the second steeping on the new clay pot, do you have an adjusted time for that as well? Yes. Second steep, you know, the, the, in total two minutes, right? Two uh, minutes, 20 seconds. Yeah, right. uh, even, uh, even so, five, so. Yeah, five. one minute, 30 seconds yeah. for the uh, second steeping for the new pot. Two. Oh, I see. I'm still going to be sitting here. I didn't even realize that. Okay, so we're still having a little bit of production still getting used to our, our new production setup here, but I actually prefer this one to last week because last week there was a lot of moving around and uh, this week there's less moving around. So we're tilting the screen so that you can see the setup here. And the setup's gonna be the usual. You're gonna have a pot, either a clay pot or a ceramic pot. You're gonna have the glass, 16 ounce glass. You don't have to have the volcanic rock that we have here. That's extra. All right, and remembering that this is a 200 degree pour, what we're gonna do is heat up the cups the same as usual. 
and everybody should have their water getting ready for 200 degrees. And we ordinarily heat both the outside and the inside of the clay pot. So we haven't emphasized necessarily a lot every single step, but this is another detail. If you're using a clay pot, go ahead and heat the clay pot as well. Pour on the outside on it and on the inside. If you don't end up doing that, again, is it going to make a world of difference? No, this is one of those accumulated details that over time you'll start to notice difference. So after heating the pot, you pour out the water and then pour in the tea leaves. And the same as usual, you're gonna shake the leaves So what are you doing here? You're trying to make sure all the leaves are getting contact with the heat. You're waking them up, so to speak. And you notice she pours both on and in. And again, if you're not set up to pour over your pot, don't worry about that. And we make sure that the cup is heated. Okay, so is there anything else? Okay, is there anything else that's really specifically different about rock orchid in terms of processing? And the answer is not really. So I can go through this processing modality with you fairly quickly. So this is a bud and two leaves. It is a spring pick. It's picked later in the spring. This is a slower grower. So it really doesn't get started picking until about April 15th, finished almost always by around May 1st. And then it goes through the complicated set of steps processing steps that all clifties do. So basically it's pick, wither, both indoors and outdoors. Once it gets to that right pliability, then to apply heat and then to knead the leaves. So you're breaking down the cells. So you're creating the opportunity for oxidation and then you apply high heat to stop the oxidation. At the end, you do roasting. So I took four months worth of hard work and reduced it to 60 seconds. So you know that my description can't be 100% complete. And the reason it's not 100% complete is because when I say wither, indoors and out, well, you know, for them up in the Wui Mountains, that takes anywhere from uh, one to 15 hours. There's this whole set of going back and forth between indoors and outdoors. And the other aspect of that is the farmers are doing this, or actually farmers and the producers are doing this in two waves. What do I mean by two waves? Did you set the timer, by the way? Oh, good. As usual, the team master is all over it, and I'm not. I, I'm used to all these mechanical devices around me, so I don't make mistakes. Uh, uh, okay. I, in my head, I had a clock running, and so I was on the money. We'll talk about those two waves in a minute. So the time has come. All right, Team Master has emptied the glass. And you notice heat is important here. So 
So carefully pouring out. And making sure that it all comes out of the glass. I'm sorry, out of the uh, brewing container. So remembering that this is a 200 degree cup of tea. This we have to use great care with. It's an inhalation rather than a real sip that you take the first time. And really the first time through, you're gonna first smell the leaves and you're gonna do it very, very carefully. And then you're gonna smell the tea liquid. And again, remembering this is 200 degrees with deliberation, with care, so that you don't burn the innards of your smelling apparatus. Okay, after getting that sense of what the aroma is, you do a 200 degree inhalation. which is more, li more like a 200 degree putting air in as you're inhaling so that you don't burn your tongue. This is really important. And it helps you avoid a mistake that Westerners typically make, which is to blow on the tea because they want to cool it down. Again, as soon as you blow, what do you do? You interfere with your ability to get the full aroma, the full feel of this tea. So the first thing you're doing is entering the quality arena. What is the quality arena? We've talked about this for several weeks now. It's first establishing mouthfeel. It isn't really about aroma and taste because aroma and taste are qualitative, aren't they? In terms of, well, I like this aroma, or I don't like this aroma, or I like this taste, or I don't like this taste. Mouthfeel is an easier thing to talk about from a quality standpoint. Is it a thin mouthfeel? Is it a dense mouthfeel? Uh, what is the level of astringency? And remembering, what's an analog that you can think of when you talk about mouthfeel? You can think of milk. For those of you who aren't lactose intolerant, what happens when you drink skim milk versus whole milk, or even more if you put cream in your mouth? You get a different mouthfeel. So that's the analog to think about. One of the analogs one can think about when you're talking about body of tea. Now, obviously, milk doesn't have astringency. And tea does. So you're looking at levels of astringency with this tea. And then as you roll it around on your tongue, you're also thinking about where in the mouth is astringency occurring. Lastly, you think about aftertaste, because as you swallow, it's going to create some sort of sensation as you swallow. And then at the very end, you're gonna have some sort of feeling of difference in your body. So I've used all sorts of words. Philosophically, people use the word chi. We use the word energetics here. You can use any word you want, but really what you're talking about is, is there a reaction in your body? after you drink this tea? Do you sense a reaction? And many times it takes a little time for that reaction to kick in. Although I find for me with cliff teas, they tend to kick in earlier for me. So I'm gonna take a second sip here, inhalation. So as I'm thinking about this, I move from the quality arena to more of, okay, what sort of flavors, what sort of aromas am I detecting? And this tea 
it's not going to be hard. This is going to be in a nanosecond, you're going to get reactions from this tea without question. So it's your turn to brew. I'll have the tea master brew with you. And one of the things you may have noticed uh, when she first poured, and I want to point this out to you because we all, as we're doing making tea, we all have experiences that end up being surprises. And so one of the surprises that occurred while she was pouring that is you notice it seemed to be pouring out of more than just the spout. Well, it was, and both Shelby and I immediately saw what the situation was, but you can't, when you're doing a demonstration like this, immediately fix it. So what happened is one of the leaves got caught between the ridge of the inside of this teapot and the, the top of the teapot. In other words, the cover of the teapot. And that caused the liquid to come out from several different places. So this occurs and that's the situation. That's why it occurred. All right. So Team Master went back and made sure that there are no leaves in between. And this is not an infrequent type of situation. You just have to be aware of it. And once you're aware of it, you make an adjustment and take care of that stray leaf, which has gotten into the wrong place. All right, so you've heated your teapot, 200 degree water, you put the leaves in, you shake them up. Mm, you get your first impression of this tea. And then you add the 200 degree water. And pour to the top. This is a 16 ounce cup. And if you're set up to, you pour on the teapot. Because Wulong tea absolutely likes more heat rather than less heat. And then you set your timer. So again, for most of you, that will be three minutes. For, the, for those of you who are using new pots, that will be two minutes and 20 seconds. All right. So I was talking about two waves for the creation of the end product of Cliff Tees. What do I mean by two waves? Well, they go through the first four or five steps all the way up to the roasting step, all within a 24 to 36 hour period. And that roasting step is a relatively short roasting step and it's called a stabilization step. Then they mark the finished product and it's not really finished, is it? It's the 70% finished product and put it on a shelf and then don't touch it for another at least 30 days. They then come back and do two or three more roastings and that's over a period of the next two to three months. So the whole process really takes from pick to actually being ready and finished close to four months. Some of the teas are a little quicker. They're quicker because the farmer producer decides to do it instead of three roastings, they decide, oh, we only need two roastings with this, in which case they're only gonna do need three months. Normally, this does not go on the market until the following year. These years, many farmers have actually gotten, gotten it on the market in the same year. And that's an economic reality. When you spend all that time, you've paid all the people who work for you. At the end, you got to make some money. So you put it on market. But usually, the soonest they would put it on market would be November, December. We get it, obviously, as soon as it's 
completely done in their eyes. And so therefore, what ends up happening is what happened with rock orchid when we first got this. When we first got this, it was still extremely edgy. So we've had other teas before, cliff teas, when they come, they're extremely edgy. And then we don't serve them or we don't have customers look in that direction. We actually have them look in another direction rather than to serve that until that roast has tamped down. What do I mean roast has tamped down? What I mean is that the roast isn't as obvious as when it first comes. All right, so the time has expired. And not in a hurry. And you notice the pour is so much better this time because we don't have a leaf stuck between the cover of the pot and the edge of the pot. This is how it should always look. Not in a hurry. We're just trying to get everything into the cup and everything out of the brewing vessel. Okay, so the first thing we do is we evaluate color. So let's take a look at this color. Yours should all look something like this. For me, I call this a beautiful dark amber color. Next, for me, we're gonna take an evaluation of the leaves. We're going to be careful because this is 200 degrees that water that was used. We're going to smell. Okay. It gives you a first impression about this tea. And then I'm going to smell the tea itself. and take a 200 degree inhalation. And so we're entering the quality arena here and we're trying to figure out what is it we're f determining in terms of mouthfeel. What is the mouthfeel like? Where is the astringency? Is there astringency? Is there, are there any odd aromas or flavors with this stuff that you think might not belong? Those are the first things you're looking at. So a couple of comments just on the heated leaves. Okay. Uh, chocolate from one student and then also a very high bright note. Love both of these comments. Uh, chocolate from the aroma and high bright notes. There are extremely high bright notes with this tea. Great comment. And you are right to be taking your time with this because this actually varies as you're going through this. And it's good to try and catch all the phases of it. And not exactly the easiest of all the cliff teas that we have to analyze. So while you're thinking of that, let me continue with the processing, those last sets of processing. Why is it that they process so many times with the roast? They've got to get it just right for that particular varietal, for that particular terroir of that year. Every year, the varietal 
can be handled differently. And your best farmers and producers do handle it differently because the results of the weather are so different from year to year. And these years where you have global warming becoming more and more obvious, the farmers are having to rely on their skills more and more by varietal, thinking about what they've experienced in a particular year. And this year, by the way, one of the things that happened in a couple of the regions was a late cold snap. That actually, from our perspective, ended up being good because it wasn't so late that it actually damaged the getting together of the crop or bringing in the crop, but it was late enough to actually wipe out the bugs that sometimes become a problem very late in the spring. I have a couple of comments on, well, the first is on the fragrance of the tea liquor, is buttery caramel, it's round and smooth in my nose. Round and smooth uh, in this particular commentator's nose with a butteriness to it, a caramel uh, sense to it. And remembering the caramel is really about the burnt chocolate, not chocolate, sugar uh, aspect of what you're smelling. And that's a great comment. I catch all of those. Also for mouthfeel, medium to thick viscosity, smooth, low astringency, deep yet light minerality. Medium to thick viscosity, low astringency. And what was the last part? Deep yet light minerality. Uh, deep but light minerality. This is why I had to have you uh, repeat that last part because that's a great comment. There is clearly minerality somewhere in this. And you can't get away from this all the way down to the bottom of the cup. And yet it's not edgy. So when we first got this, not only was the roast edgy, but the minerality itself was big and huge and interfered in some sense with other flavors that you're going to gradually uncover here. And now it's mellowed out. So this last commentator said something about softness as well. It's mellowed out in your, in your mouth. If dry, warm leaves are fruity like lychee, hints of sweetness, whiff of roasty aroma on the background. Hints of sweetness, fruity like lychee. Why do I absolutely love this comment? You know, rock orchid, it was hard until recently to grab that fruitiness. And yet, that fruitiness is absolutely a primary flavor, but it's hidden all the way until you get down a little bit into the uh, cup itself. Every Chinese commentator, when they're thinking about rock orchid, eventually comes to that fruitiness. And uh, lychee is uh, one of the fruits that they talk about. Great catch on that. Mer minerality seems to come more prominent after taking the sip isn't very upfront while drinking. Minerality seems to change as you're going through the cup. So it's not as prominent when you first take the sip, but then you experience it more and more, almost as part of the aftertaste. And I like this comment because in fact, minerality for me, kind of sticks together with astringency for me in this particular tea. So as my mouth rests, I can taste that minerality still in my mouth. I can also taste directly where the astringency is. And I have the fruitiness all going at the same time. And it's a wonderful sensation with this tea. As you drink into the cup of building dryness on the tongue and bright note that builds as you drink. Flavor I feel like an elusive orange blossom flavor or aroma. Oh, I like this. An elusive orange blossom flavor 
or aroma, and it continues to build on the tongue the farther you go into the tasting of this. And I really like this comment for a couple reasons. Remember, when you talk about a blossom of anything, or you talk about a fruit of anything, you are so close from a Western palate. Sometimes we use the same language or different language to describe the same thing. That's why I like this comment, because for me, yes, I taste more of the fruit, fruitness of it, but definitely you can call that also a blossom or a floral flavor. And so that's a great comment. Someone else also thought maybe they sense jujube. So uh, jujube as part of the underlying flavor in this. And the reason that I accept that is because actually the Chinese will on at times make that a very similar comment, not primary, but as a secondary flavor within rock orchid. Another taster, when I sip it with lots of air, it seems to give me contradictory sensations, smooth and thin, astringent and oily like tongue coating. Maybe I would describe it as astringent butter. Astringent butter was the conclusion that this commentator came to. So smooth and thin, and the commentator was really good because noted that this is in reference to aspirating. In other words, uh, uh, putting air in as you're inhaling. So you get a different feel than if you're blowing on it or you're just trying to drink this um, and you're trying to wait until it cools way down. I And astringent butter... I like that because there's no question that astringency sticks with you throughout this whole tasting experience, but it is also smooth and soft and creamy. Someone thinks that they don't feel any dryness, but instead it's actually kind of juicy. So this is an interesting comment and I like it for an unusual reason here, because there are several Chinese commentators who actually, when I've looked at their commentary, they've said something about an opening astringency and then a higher moisture as they get to the swallow. And this is what I think you are exactly reflecting, that it comes in, and yeah, that astringency is there, but then by the time you're ready to swallow, especially as it cools down, there is a, a, a real um, juiciness or there's a higher, a seemingly higher moisture content. In other words, what's happening? Let's talk about what's really happening. What's happening is that uh, you, you've left the area of your tongue where that astringency is registering, and instead you're getting the liquid portion of this and that stimulation of mouth moisture or saliva juiciness. In terms of energetics, one of the tasters says it feels warming and strengthening. Warming and strengthening. I... I absolutely love the both of these uh, comments. The warming for me is the key comment. I, as soon as I drank this, as we were going through the first cup, as soon as it, I swallowed, I got that warming feeling. I got the warming feeling in my extremities. I got it in the ears. It, it's really incredible for me how warming this tea is. Remembering that we're genetically all made up differently. So you may feel warming in different places or the sensation of warming may not be as strong for you. But for cliff teas in general, they tend, especially the medium to heavy roast, they tend to be warming for me. And a tea like rock orchid is extremely stimulating from that standpoint. 
All right. Well, you all have covered an incredible range of sensations with this tea. And you're noticing a lot about this tea. And you're noticing that it is complex. Nobody's used the word complex, but as you drink further down into the tea, the fact that you get this range from the beginning all the way to the end and it keeps changing. And you'll notice as you continue to go down this cup that it, it does keep changing. The end point from the Chinese perspective, some of you got to very quickly, and that was that fruitiness to it because there is no Chinese commentator that I've ever heard or worked with who hasn't ended up with a fruitiness with rock orchid. That is the characteristic, but it isn't the opening round characteristic. The opening round characteristic is more about the strength of this tea without the overwhelmingness uh, of, of this tea. So that's really a key element of this particular tea. And I like the fact that we started out with this one. This one is, we started with this one on purpose because uh, this next three teas, Rock Orchid, Flaming Deity, and Enveloping Fragrance have very distinctive differences in terms of flavor and in terms of where it hits you in uh, mouthfeel and in terms of the journey. The journey is so different with all of these teas and that's what's really, really important. And that's why it's important for you to take good notes uh, as you're drinking these teas because you're gonna notice that these are so distinctively different. And when I ask you the question, so in two more weeks, so when we've completed this, I'm going to ask you the following question. Which one do you like and tell better, best and tell me why? In other words, I'm looking not only for quality arena, I'm also looking for the qualitative commentary. So both things are important because when we're making a judgment about tea, we always hone in first on the quality arena elements. If we can't get past those elements, it does not matter how they've tricked up the tea uh, to make any unusual flavors. If it's thin, if it's watery, if it just has things that are unexpected or has some sort of chemical sensation to it, it's never gonna get to step two, which is to evaluate flavor and aroma and then figure out how they fit into our boards. This is how we go about determining whether we're getting tea or not from a particular farmer. It's gotta fit first. It has to earn the right to walk into Sophie's. That's the first thing. If it can't stand on its own two feet, it never gets through that door. Once it gets through the door, then it has to earn its place in terms of how is this different from other teas that we have of the same genre? And why as a consumer would anybody want to have this tea versus another tea on the board? So we use a lot of different thought patterns as we're going through and making judgments about these teas. And that's one of the reasons that Rock Orchid came up so fast for us because even though it was edgy at the very beginning, when we first had this, it was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, it, it's got all the, the quality arena attributes, but how am I going to serve this to people without having them, you know, go, wow, this is too much. So that's why, again, at the very beginning, we waited a few months until that too muchness uh, went away. And the too muchness, by the way, was about the minerality and the roast, both aspects. We knew that the roast was going to go down because we knew that as a medium to heavy roast, which this is, 
it wasn't going to stick around for a lot and they weren't trying to disguise anything. So I've talked about this before, especially with Cliff Tees. With Cliff Tees, sometimes you automatically get a clue as to what level of quality it is. And that clue is in the roast because if everything tastes extremely toasted, charcoaly, and there's not much else going on, ah, okay, we're trying to cover up something or we're trying to sneak something in here that doesn't belong in here. But when you have the medium, light, medium, or the medium to heavy, and this is actually not a heavy roast. This is a, a it's on the heavier end of medium, but it does not anywhere near get too heavy. When you're at that level of roast, you can't fool people easily because the underlying flavors, the underlying qualities of the tea will come up so quickly. When you heavy roast, that's when you're attempting to fool people, uh, sometimes attempting to fool people. Now, we have heavy roasts that are not of the fooling people category. And we'll go through some of those in future sessions. And in fact, we'll do a comparison between heavy roast and then you'll see what I mean. Right now, this is theoretical. For those of you who've been in the shop before, say, for example, if you've had a mortal guardian, a mortal guardian is clearly a heavy roast. And if you've had that and you've also had pole star, pole star is a huge roast. And yet, I ask you this for those of you who've had it is there a difference? There is a clear difference. And there is that sensibility of an underlying flavor that hasn't been wiped away by the roast. So that's how we knew right away that rock orchid, that that roast was going to decline because it was medium roast. The minerality, we had no clear sensibility as to what would end up with the balance of the tea as the roast quieted down. But we knew that there'd be a rebalancing of everything because minerality also typically over time tends to decline. So if you get a cliff tea from somewhere outside of Sophie's, the, you may, one of the things you may want to think about right away is this so-called balance. Because again, many tea purveyors don't really have the language to talk about balance. But even worse, most customers don't have the sensibility of that balance. Now, you all have the sensibility of the balance because you have such a great big selection to choose from. And you've done this over such a, a long period of time. And we've used language together that makes sense uh, as we analyze these, these teas. So this is always when you're looking, when we're looking as buyers, we're looking at not only, well, don't tell me what it is today, because I see what it is today. Tell me what it's going to be. And that is what we're looking for. What is that balance proposition when we start to drink the teas? Farmers, by the way, they'll tell you stuff not intentionally misleading you. They are not intentionally misleading you. The farmers are talking from a farmer's perspective. But remember, we're talking from a tea drinker's perspective. So there's a difference here. And that's one of the reasons I'm spending so much time on this. And this is why this is such a good example of this, because at the very end of the day, though none of you actually used the term balance, that's what this is. This is a hugely balanced, really with interesting components uh, tea, Cliff tea. So we have a few more comments. Okay. Um, so to go back to, you said we didn't say complexity and that's true, but we have been talking about dichotomy between dryness and juice. And um, what was the other one Rob said? 
complexity as or uh, let me go, let me go. Contradictory sensations. So we're oh. getting there. We're just rhetorically different. <laughs> um, also, uh, the wet leaves give out a sharp aroma, almost peppery at the beginning, which gets soft as heat dissipates and other aromas of sweetness, creaminess, and subtle minerality. I, I, um, um, I enjoy the contradictory ways of, uh, I, I really enjoy your comment, Rob, about the fact that, yes, you didn't use the word complexity, but you got the contradictions, you got the differences that were going on, and you are, actually all did. And, uh, you know, I, that wasn't a complaint on my part in terms of not using uh, complexity. It's just the, the uh, so you've said it correctly. You did get the dichotomies, wonderful job. In terms of the creaminess, the uh, depth of this tea, love that this comment because you started off, I remember one of the very early comments was something about astringent butteriness. And when you say something like astringent butteriness, that also is a reflection of how complicated a tea is, because usually you wouldn't use those two terms together. But you all detected that complexity and in quotes balance that this tea has. It has both of those things going on. And that's really, I think, what all of you are reflecting on as you uh, say the, these comments, including the fact that you're able to not get hung up on astringency and still detect at the end of the day the fruitiness and the sweetness. And that's really important because this definitely at the end of the day should leave you with that pleasant feeling of, gosh, this is, could be a substitute for, for juice. Well, not really, but the, the sensibility that this, is, this has these other very pleasant sensations uh, within it. The same commenter mentions that his experience, he's not confident in his experience of balance because he's not tasted any tea out of balance. And I wonder if maybe you are just training us <laughs> so that we don't know what bad is because we don't have to experience it ever. Well, now this is a great comment. And, and in it is a question. The question is, are you and Shalbe on purpose training us to only understand balance and to only have the experience of balance? And the answer to that would be kind of yes. We've gone through the out of balance experiences and I don't see why you should have to go through those experiences unless you go to someplace else outside of Sophie's. And the, within Sophie's, the focus is on trying to get you to experience the highest levels of balance, complexity, interestingness. Shopping and I have led very fortunate tea lives. We've led extremely fortunate tea lives because we've tasted literally thousands of teas over the last 20 years. And by doing that, we've had plenty of the out of balance, not good, not up to standard experiences. So we're real, real clear what those experiences can be like. And that drove us to approach the tea industry differently than so many other tea purveyors, because many other tea purveyors, and this is not a knock against other tea purveyors, by the way, every tea purveyor has worked hard to get to the position that they are at. And every tea purveyor, I believe, starts out in love with tea. I absolutely believe that. And I absolutely believe that they're trying to share their passion for tea with um, other people. So there's never been a question about sincerity of tea purveyors. Our 
difference, we believe, is that we've tried to really hone out or try to really sift out the stuff that after years of experience shows that there's these great ranges of tea experience. So that was a confused way of saying the following thing. Let me make this real clear. Uh, we've had bad tea. We have decided we don't want bad tea in the shop. We've had good teas. Good teas are good. Then we've had the special teas. Special teas are great. We're trying to have you all have the special teas experience every single time. And you notice price is not an in, a necessary indicator of that because we've got teas priced all over the, the spectrum. It's really every tea has to bring some sort of specialness in its category before it gets on the board. So that was a very long-winded way of responding uh, to your, your comment. Well, we're all, we're all tea snobs now, so I'm sure we can sniff out the lack of balance anywhere we go. <laughs> uh, just a couple more, I'm mindful of the time, so just a couple yeah. more comments. Um, there's a taste very smooth with light minerality towards the end, a subtle astringency and finish off with hints of sweetness. Um, also, minerality became more present as the cup cooled further. Good. Uh, both comments uh, have validity. Min I especially like the minerality uh, popping up, which is kind of the reverse of what we're used to. We're, we're used to minerality being perhaps less apparent as you get down in a cup. In this particular cup, you go through that fruit phase and the sweetness phase, and then you realize, oh yeah, the base is minerality hiding under all that fruit and sweetness. So a uh, great set of comments. There's also a, a small community discussion on how this may not be the favorite flavor profile, but that we all enjoy each other's appreciable traits for tea tasting. Um, and I'd sum it up, we're all in it together, is what it seems like. This is a very special community. And so um, they're all acknowledging each other in the chat there. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Megan. Uh, this is a special tea community. And the reason we uh, appreciate and we continue to do these sessions is because of the specialness of this community. You, you, you notice, maybe you remember, or maybe you don't, maybe you weren't part of the early sessions. Those of you who were part of the early sessions, you remember that we were just trying to establish guardrails so we wouldn't all hurt ourselves in, in terms of the commentary. Well, that era is long gone because we come and we have really smart dialogues about the teas and dialogues that the Chinese tea masters, that level of person would have. And that's one of the reasons we've continued to do this because we've seen such great progress we have so much fun with all of you when it comes to talking about the various appreciations of the tea. And sometimes you surprise the heck out of us in ways that are unexpected, totally unexpected to us. And um, today was uh, an example because you got to the fruit portion of this tea so fast. Uh, we expected all of you, by the way, to get to that fruit portion. We didn't expect it within five or six minutes of the first sip of it. All of you are, are uh, a number of you getting to that uh, so quickly. So great job on that. We've enjoyed this session in particular very, very much. We look forward to next week. Next week is Flaming Deity. And Flaming Deity has a certain specialness to it as well, which you'll discover next week. Next week, you'll see us in our more familiar digs. Uh, we will have the more familiar format. We'll have everything that you're used to seeing. But it's really been interesting that we've been able to do this on the road the last two weeks. And we've, 
we're really glad that we made this effort to do it. And we're really appreciative that you uh, participate with us and help make this so special. So for this next week, hoping all of you stay safe as usual and have a great, great week. And we'll see you next Saturday. Y'all take care. Megan, thanks again. My, my great pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye exactly. now. Thanks, Megan. Bye-bye. Bye, John. Bye-bye, John. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. See you in the shop, John. Hey, thank you. <laughs>